I wanted this to be a positive video, I really did. But hear me out, after fully completing the most recent battle pass, I can definitively say Deep Rock Galactic Season 4 content is mid at best and it's easily the game's most disappointing season to date. The Corruptor fight is simultaneously tedious and underwhelming. The Stingtail is overtuned in almost every metric. The new Hurricane Overclock Rocket Barrage is a pea shooter that can't even out DPS a clean overclock. The Rockbox enemies have reached the point where they just might be even more annoying to fight than the robots. And frankly, I don't even know how some of the new Rockbox vary made it past internal playtesting in their current state. I mean, even this season's paid cosmetic DLC pack was received so poorly by the community that the devs felt obliged to rework it. And spoiler alert, it's still a step back compared to the other recent packs. And I'm not the only one who feels this way about season 4. One month into the season, I pulled the DRG subreddit to see how others felt about the new content, and not gonna lie, it was pretty validating to see how many other people felt similarly. Considering the game holds an overwhelmingly positive rating on Steam, the same like a pretty steep decline in player sentiment. Hear me out, the last thing I want to do in this video is to be negative for the sake of being negative. You'll see in this video I really have tried my best to phrase my criticism in a constructive manner, and for every problem I bring up I'll also try to throw in some potential solutions. Even if you love season 4 and its new additions, well first of all your opinion is just as valid as mine, and I'm not here to rain on your parade. And second, I still think you'll see that some of my proposed concepts can make the game better for us all. I know parts of this community suffer from toxic positivity, shutting down criticism at first sight. But just because Ghost Ship launches a consumer-friendly anti-FOMO mechanic for old Battle Pass content, for example, shouldn't make them immune to the criticism about how that exact same mechanic has diluted and bloated the cargo crates and lost equipments into an absurd thousand plus hour grind. Stifling constructive criticism or dismissing it entirely is counterproductive, and we can all do better than that. I'm not pointing out flaws in this game because I dislike it, but quite the opposite. I still find the game as a whole incredibly fun to play, it's just that I don't think Deep Rock has been heading in the right direction recently. I care deeply about this game and wish to see it continue to improve over time. All that being said, let's lace up our jet boots together and hop on in cause things are gonna get bumpy. I gotta give credit where credit is due. Season 4 did do some things right. My favorite addition, unironically, is the Jetty Boot arcade machine in the Space Rig. Maybe it's my nostalgia of having played the OG Flappy Bird, but Jetty Boot and its predecessor both share this addictive simplicity to their game design. You could probably tame a Glyphid with Beastmaster, shove that chunky little iPad in its face, and Steve would beat level 1 before you could even finish fighting a Rockpox Corruptor. The point is, Jetty Boot is simple and fun and chasing a new high score is addictive. And that's all you could really ask for in a mini game that's meant to burn time while you wait for your friends to hop on. I also love how the Jetty Boot high score list acts as an impromptu logbook of the fellow dwarves who have visited each player's space rig. Maybe this is the first step towards having more personalization in the space rig which I know some players have requested before. If the devs never change a thing about Jetty Boot, I'd still be content. If they do want to iterate on the idea though, I'd love for multiplayer Jetty Boot to be a thing. It could be as simple as strapping some of those iPads to the side of the arcade machine so others could join in on the fun. I just think it'd be neat if you could challenge your friends to a friendly jetty boot wager match loser has to buy a round of the buff beers for the next mission you know N wow i did click i did click at least it was a high score up next are the actual jet boots themselves. I would say that these are overall a good addition to the game. Cave traversal is one of the biggest hurdles that Greenbeards face, so it's fun to stumble upon the ultimate traversal tool once in a while. That's convenient. My favorite aspect of jet boots is how it synergizes with dash. Wee dash! The boots allow you to extend dash's speed boost significantly, allowing you to travel across a huge cave in a split second. And pulling off this movement tech while carrying a heavy object is especially satisfying. Ooh, that was sick. I did want to provide some feedback regarding the way jet boots were implemented. Making jet boots a RNG chance encounter to keep their power in check is lazy game design. I'm not saying that jet boots should be more common, but it'd be neat if there was a way to earn them as a reward within a mission, perhaps through the corruptor fight for example. Also, jet boots don't feel great on higher latency. It's most noticeable if you're good at timing bunny hops. If you have jet boots on, you can literally activate them when grounded if you hit spacebar too soon after landing. And it feels really jarring to hit jet boots for a split second when you're expecting to do a full jump. It's a shame that some core player input and movement mechanics are latency dependent, and I suspect not enough testing is done internally on less than stellar ping. 
Okay, this next one isn't really a big deal, but I like Jet Boots the tool and I like Jetty Boot the game. But using a Flappy Bird style game to unlock the boot crate just doesn't really make sense lore wise. Compared to the hacking mini games for taming patrol bots, router events, and the turret controller and rival presence missions. Again, minor nitpick, but I think it's worth noting. Each season comes with its own completely free performance pass and accompanying cosmetic tree, and it's hard to criticize free content like this. In my opinion, the best things are the infected weapon frameworks found within the cosmetic tree. I think the pulsating rock pox on the weapons is more unique and visually interesting than even the paid decontaminator frameworks, especially in first person view. I guess you could say that's a win for the players so they don't feel pressured to buy the paid DLC, but it also just doesn't feel great from the perspective of someone who wants to keep supporting the devs by buying each season's DLC. Something I didn't notice until working on this video is that the early tiers of the pass have noticeably more filler items. Tiers 1 through 50 have about half the amount of notable items and twice the amount of filler items compared to tiers 51 through 100. I understand battle passes are intentionally designed to place the more coveted stuff in the later tiers to maximize playtime, but it it just seems unnecessary to backload the pass on top of that instead of just distributing the cool items evenly. The next welcome addition to Season 4 is the improved input buffering for semi-auto weapons. Before this update, clicking too fast would lead to some dead inputs, and it was especially noticeable on something like the Hipster M1000 if you had a fast trigger finger. In the past, I always knew Hipster was good but rarely used it because of this sole issue, and I'm glad that the semi-auto weapons feel better to shoot now. Every season comes with some weapon and overclock balance changes, and I do want to applaud Ghost Ship, they made some good substantial changes this season. In fact, I think season 4 would have gotten a much better reception if Ghost Ship made overclocks a primary focus, through even more overclock reworks and additions. Because the reality is, we as players have gotten used to getting new equipable gear in all 3 previous seasons, and season 4 was the first to deviate from this trend. Anyways, here are my thoughts on the most notable overclock reworks. Oh, oh I, I'm such a bot. I'm such a bot. Double barrel was changed so it actually feels like it's firing both barrels at once, with a further increased emphasis on blast wave damage. I'm not gonna lie, I was skeptical of this rework since I'm someone who almost exclusively uses special powder when I'm rocking the boomstick. But I gave double barrel a spin and it's really fun grouping up hordes of grunts with IFGs or pheromone nades and then instantly clearing them out with a single shot. Two quick double barrel shots and a few more from your primary weapon will make light work of any Praetorian as well. Oh, okay, that's pretty satisfying though. It is possible to go through ammo pretty fast with double barrel, but it's not as bad as I thought it'd be. The hard part is not overusing it because of how satisfying it is to shoot. Good job, ghost ship. All right, this is pretty fun. <laughs> double barrel, it might be kind of cracked. Cryo Cannon Snowball Projectile now costs less ammo and has a new thaw prevention mechanic. I love the Cryo Cannon and I find the base version more than sufficient, but Snowball feels great now. Swarmers. Swarmers. I try to snowball on it. It'd be so dumb. <laughs> it's pretty funny though. Since the overclock comes with an innate loss of 100 ammo already, I think reducing the ammo cost of each snowball from 35 to 25 was definitely the right move. The snowballs themselves are pretty versatile, and I like to think of them like Scout's Cryonade but with a smaller radius. Good against Mactera waves, can flash freeze at range, or quickly burst a dread that's halfway frozen. Oh, what do we have? Versus. Oh my oh, god, dude. Oh. The freaking plasma burst missile is gonna be kind of cracked. Plasma Burster missiles for the Hurricane actually feel good to use now since the missiles won't just randomly die when they hit terrain while circling around an enemy. I haven't used this overclock in a long time due to that reason specifically, so I enjoyed revisiting it because it's quite satisfying seeing your single target damage ramp up to borderline absurd levels. Are you guys getting the full lead right now? <laughs> I still don't like how this overclock promotes a tunnel vision playstyle where you have to keep your crosshair glued to an enemy, so I don't think I'll be using it very often, but I can see the appeal for sure. Because, oh, watch out, by the way, you're about to get wrapped up. Ah! That's the only thing is I hate having to keep my cursor on stuff because, like, I, well, there with another gun, yeah. I would have looked up. Drax's shield battery booster now also significantly reduces the delay before your shield starts regenerating, and if you combine it with the related armor mod, this delay gets cut all the way down to just a second or two. Yeah, that delay is pretty nutty. I still think this overclock would feel better if its damage and velocity boosts at full shields instead scaled in proportion with your current shield level. So if you had, say, half shields, you get half of both bonuses. It just doesn't feel great when they get instantly nullified by a single swarmer nip or a teammate's stray bullet. Also, the overclock is still a pain to use in biomes with chip damage features like fungus bogs or magma core, and it's completely invalidated by the shield disruption warning. 
Season 4 also came with a handful of miscellaneous smaller changes that didn't warrant their own segments, so let's speed through them here. There's now a dedicated button for copy pasting loadouts. I will always welcome more quality of life additions to the game and I hope to see more in the future. The non-DLC armors now all have a sleeveless variant. It's nice to have more options since we all know Dwarf Drip is the true endgame, am I right? We got a new track called Journey of the Prospector. It's the final parting gift from Ghost Ship's sound designer before he moved on from the company. Oh hey, it's playing right now. And finally, my pick for the most underrated change this season is that the Praetorian's visual spit particles were updated to match its actual hitbox. It now looks like it spits much further and faster, but this is how big the hitbox was all along. I'm gonna be honest, that's about it for the positives in season 4. It's not the smallest list, which is good I guess, but at the same time, I don't think the main draws of season 4, like the Corrupter, Stingtail, or Spreader, are worth a spot up here in their current state. But don't worry, we'll get to them in due time. This next section contains all the stuff that I either feel too indifferent or conflicted about to put a definitive good or bad label on. Let's start with the remainder of the weapon and overclock changes. Driller Subata got some significant reworks to its weapon mods. Notably, the pistol now has a two round burst option that can one burst grunts to the head and a new tier five neuro corrosive toxic catalyst mod which synergizes with the sludge pump. Was the Subata changed enough for me personally to start using it? Honestly, no. I still think the weapon can't compete against the utility and power of EPC's thin containment field, and it also falls short when compared to the general versatility of the wave cooker, which excels at deleting groups of shockers and swarmers, but can also burst down large single targets with temp shock, all while having infinite hitscan range and soft aimbot. I do think it was the right call to try to bring the Subata up instead of dragging the others down by nerfing TCF for example, which is kept in check by its heavy ammo consumption and relatively steep learning curve to time the shots consistently. Subata's tranquilizer rounds overclock was also updated so it can slow enemies which are immune to stun. This is cool for bulks and oppressors I guess? Overall I appreciate the thought and care given to the Subata in season 4, but I will still almost never use it, cause to me popping off TCF shots is too satisfying to give up. Next, many a gunner main's favorite overclock neurotoxin payload kinda got nerfed. It now has an ammo and AoE penalty, but the overclock's downside of lower direct damage was completely removed. I'm not really sure the point of these changes since it just seems like a mild nerf combined with a mild buff, resulting in a power level that's about the same as before. I guess the intention was to slightly nudge more players to use Carpet Bomber instead, which was buffed to synergize multiplicatively instead of additively with the AoE weapon mods. And finally, the one new overclock we got this season, Hurricane's Rocket Barrage. Alright, on pra two Praetorians, let's go. Oh my god, this is so bad. Oh, Stingtail. Oh, reload, 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 reload. Do, 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 do. <laughs> it's so bad. I told you this might be worse than Magnum for shit. Do, 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 do. Oh my god, I killed it. I actually killed something. Man, I wish this overclock was better since it sure looks cool spamming all those rockets, but it's just underwhelming in both its stats and how it actually feels to use. I can't even see the weak point. Do, 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 do. Too many particles. Do, 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 do. I'm getting carried by the area damage. Can someone at Ghost Ship explain why Rocket Barrage is outclassed in DPS, damage per mag, and total damage when compared to the clean, overtuned feed mechanism? Furthermore, you completely lose missile guidance with Rocket Barrage, thus tanking your accuracy and DPS even more when engaging enemies outside of anything further than point blank range. Dude, I can't believe I'm missing. I'm missing on grunts that are like right next to me. It's crazy. Literally the only upside I can think of for Rocket Barrage is that you're proccing tier 5 stun more consistently due to its increased fire rate. But like most enemies are gonna be dead already if you just picked any other hurricane overclock. Oh my god, look how good I am at proccing stun. That's what this game is all about. Why kill enemies when you can just proc stun on them, right? I was pretty surprised that Rocket Barrage didn't come with at least a mag size increase. It makes tier 3A, which doubles your mag size to 72, basically a must pick mod, unless you want to spend almost half your time reloading the weapon. This got me thinking about how none of the hurricane overclocks affect its mag size, which seems kind of weird. If the devs don't want to change Rocket Barrage's damage numbers, they should at least look at improving its projectile velocity so it's more usable at range. And I think it's a shame the overclock doesn't have any unique mechanics like an accelerating fire rate the longer you hold the trigger, which would have given the overclock a more distinct identity, because currently it's just another unstable pea shooter overclock in the vein of mini shells or micro flechettes. Yo, I was gonna ask you, do you wanna do a randomizer mission? A randomizer? Yeah. 
I almost forgot about that being in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that's so funny. I never use the randomizer, and it's a shame because it's this close to being something that I would enjoy. Let's first evaluate the beer in its current state, though. I don't necessarily dislike the randomizer, but I just have no incentive to use it. When the only endgame the vanilla game offers past Has 5 is refining your playstyle to become more efficient while blue rank grinding, why would I actively use a non theory crafted and non synergistic build other than for the memes? I have two ammo mods on combat rounds, which already gives me more ammo. Oh no. Okay, I got zero damage EM refire and I got zero damage PGL. Oh god. 99% of the time that I'm playing, my friends or I are hosting Has5 pub lobbies focused on getting missions done quick, and in the time it's taken to finish the battle pass, I haven't seen any random teammates order the drink either. I get that this playstyle isn't for everyone, and it's fun to mess around once in a while. At the same time, playing with a randomized build is probably just going to sour your opinion on weapons or overclocks that you haven't used before. You'd probably think hyperprop is dog water if it gave you the area damage mods with it. Oh, I don't have born ready. Oh, I have to reload the PGL. Using a new overclock can already be a challenge in itself as you're getting used to its quirks, so piling unoptimal mods and doubling that with your other weapon just really doesn't seem that fun to me, and I really don't think Greenbeard me would have felt differently. It felt weird of not running dash on Gunner. Yeah, and on NG. Yeah. Would I have Berserker and Shield Link? Oh god. Instead, I really wish Ghost Ship collected analytics on the popular mod choices for each overclock, so then Randomizer could randomly roll your weapons and their overclocks, but also give you a logical set of mods to complete the build. If Randomizer worked this way, the beer could even function as a subtle in-game learning tool for Greenbeards, while retaining its fun mystery factor. How am I supposed to kill an oppressor? My PGL is not going to do anything. This is not doing anything because I have like no damage on EM Refire. Oh my god. I also think Randomizer would have been even more fun for Greenbeards if the beer could pull random overclocks from the entire pool instead of just the ones you already own. We all know how bad the overclock grind is, and the Randomizer could have acted as this fun little teaser for what lies ahead. What's the harm in letting players sample some cool overclocks that they don't have access to yet? And given the beer's high material cost of 10 starch nuts, it's not like players would be able to exploit this mechanic even if they tried. Oh, let me berserk this fool! Hey, you should do that actually, just bully him. Yeah, see, it's so low. Oh my so god. Low. And seriously, why does the randomizer cost so much when you could just hit the randomize buttons in the equipment terminal and wardrobe and get essentially the same effect? I get that the beer hides your loadout until you're fully in the mission. Okay, so just click the random button and close your eyes while you're closing the menus. This redundancy is a bit silly to me when randomizer is the most expensive beer in the entire game in terms of brewing materials. And you can just press two buttons to get its effects completely free. At least, I'm, at least I can fear the sting tail with my PGL. That's pretty much all it's good for at this point. It's unfortunate because I do think if the devs fleshed out Randomizer a bit more, it could have even become a fun meta game with its own mini progression system. Imagine if the game tracked each player's streak of successful Randomizer missions, and you had something to show for said streak. Something even as simple as being able to display your highest streak next to your username, for example. It would add direct incentives for using the beer and spice up your missions by raising the stakes. One failure and it's back to square one. The idea could use some further refining to minimize potential griefing, for example. But man, every time I think about the randomizer in its current state, I just think about what it could have been. It was so close to being good. Well, we actually got a dub. Finally, perhaps the most important item in this tier, it's time to talk about the Septic Spreader. Between the two new base enemies added to the game in Season 4, I think the Septic Spreader is in a much better place. It's strong and has huge area denial potential, but it's balanced by being highly visible and relatively squishy. I still think it needs some work though, and here's why. How the spreader checks for line of sight needs to be improved, because currently it can just hide out of sight, arcing its sepsis goo perfectly so it can hit you but you can't even see it. Oh no, 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 I'm panicking, I'm panicking, I'm panicking, where are you guys? This problem is most evident in the holdout stages of salvage, where spreaders will commonly camp the top of the drop pod or other pesky areas, lobbing goo down on the tiny zone that you have to stay in. Only Scout has an easy time getting up there to deal with the threat. The other classes can only wait for the tiny opening if and when it chooses to expose itself. You could try leaving the zone quickly to find a better vantage point, but it might not work depending on the cave gen, and it's also significantly less viable for solo play. Really unfair move. Here's some footage of the devs themselves failing a salvage mission, primarily wait, 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 due guys, to septic spreaders. Oh no, I'm down. Oh, those oh spreaders, no! Those man. spreaders are. Alright, I'm gonna, I'm gonna iron will. I'll iron will. I'll, I'll just go down. 
These spreaders are spreading. He's gonna get septic. Holy cow, man. Oh. oh. Uh, boy, F in the chat for real. Currently, the only way to remove the sepsis goo is to delete the terrain under it with TCF or C4s, which just isn't practical in something like a salvage holdout. Covering the goo with platforms doesn't protect you unless you stack three or more, which is equally unfeasible since by the time you cover all the goo, it's probably already despawned. I'd like to see more counterplay options against the spreaders, which could facilitate more interesting gameplay. Perhaps shooting the goo that's already landed on the ground would remove it. This would at least make reviving teammates and holdout style objectives less frustrating. How am I supposed to reach this guy? Oh my god! Yo! How did he go that fast? Or, shooting the goo while it's airborne should disrupt its trajectory so it lands straight below instead of continuing its arc. And it could maybe even disable the goo from spreading out into a larger puddle when it hits the floor. I'd be okay with a slight increase to the goo's projectile speed to balance things out. These kinds of mechanics would make the spreader less frustrating without nerfing its damage. Even if you can't get rid of the spreader immediately in the chaos of a salvage holdout, these counters give you options to mitigate the threat in the meantime. I just hear s s s s s how many spreaders is that? Dude, holy, how many spreaders? Alright team, you're going after eggs this time. Alien eggs. Can't miss them, they're big and they're low. Get the eggs to stow them in Molly and get back alive. Well, we finally made it to the juicy stuff. Speaking frankly, I suspect a lot of the following criticism won't resonate if you primarily play at lower hazard levels. If you enjoy fighting the Corrupter and you think the Stingtail is balanced on Haz 3, honestly I'm happy for you and your opinion is valid, you're allowed to enjoy the game. But you simply won't see or feel game design imbalances as much when everything hits for a wet noodle and dies when you so much as sneeze at it. Getting incapacitated when your rock pox meter fills up isn't as punishing when there's fewer enemies surrounding you. Fall damage from an unlucky stingtail grab doesn't matter as much when you can just walk it off. You'll probably never have to deal with the annoyance of fighting an ambient wave when engaging with a Corruptor on Haz 3, since these waves are spaced much further apart in lower Haz levels. And even if you do, it's what, like 4 grunts? I want to be clear, I'm not saying all this to belittle players who choose to play on lower Haz levels, but to provide them with important context that affects all the upcoming feedback. Chances are, the more you play the game, the more you'll end up bumping into the same issues I have and the more you'll agree with my criticism. This game should feel like a fair challenge no matter what hazard level you're playing on, so I'm gonna point out the imbalances where I see them. And again, I'm not bringing up all this stuff because I'm a hater, but because Ghost Ship actively welcomes player feedback and I want Deep Rock to change for the better. So keep that in mind and let's all try to be civil in the comments, okay? Speaking plainly, it's sad that the Corrupter, Season 4's biggest draw and most notable addition, lands all the way down here in the Needs Work section. I get that this is a subjective ranking and I'm not immune to personal bias, but I'm not the only one who feels this way. In my reddit poll, the top voted comment even stated that Harold straight up isn't fun to fight. Another reference point is that in past seasons, newer players who joined my lobby were excited to engage in the seasonal mechanics. In season 4, I've almost exclusively encountered people disliking the Corrupter fight, and even the Greenbeards are occasionally choosing to skip it. I've thought a lot about how the Corrupter is designed, and if I'm gonna be honest, the only good thing about it is that you're not forced to fight it if you don't want to. You have to intentionally start the fight by first calling in the cleaning supplies, and it's very hard if if not outright impossible to accidentally aggro it. Guess they learned something from the prospector. Oh, oh, I forgot. Okay then, what makes the corruptor so unfun? First, it's tedious to fight. Constantly juggling the lithofoamer and vacuum is kind of tolerable when I'm just dealing with the contagion spikes, but it's become a huge source of friction that's reached a breaking point now that the tools have to be used in combat on a moving enemy. Oh, cool. Where did my, where did my tool go? It literally just dropped down there. Even something as basic and fun as cave traversal feels like a chore when you have to lug these tools up and down the caves with you. The whole litho tool system desperately needs an overhaul so it doesn't feel like such a hassle. Ideally, players would be able to retain possession of a tool even if they switch off of it, and a new keybind could be added so players could switch back to the tool at any time. I know this would take more work to implement than the current band-aid solution of adding the bright floating icons to the drop tools, but a rework would be a massive quality of life increase for both the corruptor fight and the contagion spikes. 
To make matters worse, the Corruptor prefers running away from the dwarves after it's been aggroed. This completely invalidates the core Deep Rock tenet of manipulating the caves to work in your favor during combat. For example, a common strategy when fighting dreads is to clear out the spawn room with C4s and to plat over the drop pod divot so that your team has clear lines of sight during the whole fight. This idea seems doubly important for a fight like the Corruptor since it's also capable of manipulating the terrain around you. But terraform all you want, it'll just zoom away to some less ideal spot. What? Where is it floating? This is so dumb. What? How am I supposed to rotate? How am I supposed to rotate? Once you reach the acceptance stage of how annoying this makes the fight, it's actually pretty funny seeing the Corruptor randomly just hit the jets and scurry away. Like, it's such a baffling design decision to make the Corruptor behave this way. It's tedious enough that you're juggling the tools while you're trying to rotate around it to find the right angle to foam the blisters while simultaneously dodging the corrupted patches it leaves behind, but apparently that's not punishing enough. The Corruptor also gets the ability to run away from you, forcing you to play catch up on top of everything else. This is so cursed. Oh my god, dude. Are you serious? You might think this is fine since the Prospector also moves in an evasive way once aggroed, but it's much more unfun when the Corruptor does it because of all the aforementioned tool juggling. When you're fighting the Prospector, especially a scout, you're rewarded for keeping up with its movement and keeping it pinged since this helps speed up the fight, which also minimizes the number of robot waves the Prospector spawns in. Another difference between the two fights is that most builds can fight the Prospector from afar as long as you have direct line of sight on it, which makes the Prospector's movement a lot easier to stomach. In comparison, the Corruptor forces you to keep a close engagement distance due to the Litho Vacuum's limited reach. And again, the Corruptor leaves behind the infected patches that you also have to dodge while trying to keep up with it. The Prospector doesn't have any mechanic like this. Dude, look how quick this fight is compared to the Corruptor. Reach. This fight is already fit It already failed much more fun. Yeah. This was actually... We didn't know how good we had it back then, man. It's crazy. The Corruptor behavior should be changed so that it must stay within a certain radius of where you call the cleaning supplies. I think this would be a good compromise where it can still retain its evasive pathing, but players can also dictate where they want the fight to take place. Because currently a fleeing Corruptor doesn't make the fight much harder, it just extends the length of the fight and makes it more frustrating for no reason. Also, another reason why the Corruptor fight feels so tedious is that fighting it does not pause ambient waves of enemies from spawning, unlike a Dreadnought fight. Oh nice ambient wave. In Haz 5, it's pretty common to encounter multiple ambient waves during a single Corruptor fight even. I get that aggroing the Prospector also doesn't pause ambient waves, but first, that fight is shorter so it's less of an issue in the first place. Second, you have to dodge the Corruptor's patches while fighting these other enemies, otherwise you'll get CC'd. The Prospector just runs away. And third, being forced to drop and relocate the litho tools makes task switching more involved. I think there's a pretty simple solution to this. Just pause ambient waves from spawning for something like 5 minutes once you aggro the corruptor. This allows players to fully focus on the boss fight without distractions, which is sorely needed considering how multi-dimensional this fight is. This change should make the fight less overwhelming for most players in most situations. Bosco, what are you doing, man? Are you high? I told you to foam it or s s vacuum it. That is insane. You would think that fighting the Corruptor solo would be better since all you have to do is foam and Bosco can handle the vacuuming, but in reality, it's not much better. After Bosco fully vacuums a segment and thus exposing the Corruptor's weak point, he will switch to attacking the weak point instead of continuing to vacuum the other sections. Can you just foam, dude? What? Bro, foam. The issue is that he usually doesn't even have a clear line of sight to this weak point, so he's not even doing any damage to it. Therefore, you have to keep pinging the foam to tell Bosco to focus on that instead. And if you're going to have to drop your foamer frequently just to ping, you might as well just juggle the tools yourself and vacuum it manually. Bosco should prioritize vacuuming the Corruptor whenever there's foam remaining on it. And he should also prioritize shooting the Rockpox larva above shooting the weak point, which should probably just be the lowest priority. Piling up all these issues all together, you can see why fighting the Corruptor feels like such a chore. Not only is the Corruptor tedious to deal with, the fight can feel ambiguous. For example, it's too much work to spot and target specific blisters on it, so I just haphazardly spray as much foam on it as I can. 
Also, it's difficult to tell which player the Corruptor is actively targeting since it doesn't really face a direction. In fact, does it even target specific players outside of its vine attack? Something as simple as the health bar can be confusing to new players since it's hard to tell at a glance whether the Corruptor weak points are currently vulnerable or not. Come watch this poor scout get downed by the Corruptor, then immediately iron will to try to finish off the final weak point. Except that weak point is still protected, so all that effort was for nothing. I don't even blame the scout for trying what they did because they most likely saw that the Corruptor had a sliver of red HP left and figured it was almost dead, not realizing that disjointed bit of the yellow armor bar was protecting the remainder of the health. I think it'd be a lot less confusing for Greenbeards if the Corruptor just had three separate health bars, one for each weak point, and each was protected by their respective yellow armor bars. Where I really notice the ambiguity is in the audio and visual cues for the Corruptor's attacks. They aren't immediately obvious, and they're less clear when compared to the other bosses in the game. So you can end up losing half your health bar in a split second, wondering what damage do you. What? What attacked me there? Look, I get it, the Corruptor doesn't have all that many moves. It can leave behind the Corrupted Patches, do a Ground Slam, and send out its vines. When you remove some blisters, it'll spawn in some Rockbox larva and maybe push you away. The problem is that the two most dangerous attacks, the Ground Slam and the vines, are not clearly telegraphed to the player right before they happen. Their audio cues sound weird, which I guess makes sense since the Corruptor is some kind of semi-sentient behemoth, but they're not as easily understandable as something like a Dreadnought Growl right before it stomps. Where the Corruptor fight really falls short is in the visual cues for the Ground Slam and Vine attacks. They're a huge step back compared to the visual design of other boss attacks like the bombs that the Caretaker, Nemesis, and Betsy use. Those bombs have a clear telegraph. If you're standing in the brightly lit zone surrounding a bomb, you better get out ASAP. It's simple and clearly conveyed. This is good design especially considering how many other things your attention is split between during these engagements. Now, compare that to the Corruptor's Ground Slam attack. Anyone who has fought the Corruptor before knows that it'll briefly rise up before slamming down. But did you know that there's another visual cue for the stomp? The Corruptor surrounds itself with a ring of tiny particles, which is supposed to indicate the stomp's radius. The issue is that these particles are so subtle that I didn't notice it in the dozen plus Corruptors I encountered in-game. It was only until I studied its attack patterns in the perfectly lit sandbox utilities room that I was able to get a better understanding of the stomp's danger zone by looking for the edge of this particle cloud. The vine attack needs work too. There's already so much visual clutter from the corrupted patches that sometimes it's really hard to spot the vine attack on top of that. And since the corruptor doesn't have a distinct front side that it faces, it's hard to know which player it's attacking until it's too late. <laughs> like, dude, there is no... What's the word? There's no telegraph. Oh, and yeah, on top of all this, the vines can target you through walls or terrain. The solution to this issue is simple. The Ground Slam and Vine Attack both need much more obvious visual cues, similar to the brightly lit danger zones that act as precursors to the other boss's bomb attacks. These warning indicators give the player plenty of time to react and reposition accordingly. I was watching a friend play Ember Knights recently and noticed how much better telegraph similar boss moves were in that game. So just go copy them, I guess. Another issue with the Corruptor is that, even if you ignore all the previous criticism, the fight still ends up feeling pretty underwhelming. First, the blue weak points are extremely squishy, yet also take damage in a strange way that I've never seen before in this game. Take this clip for example, where I shoot 4 hipster M1000 shots at the final weak point. Why does the first shot deal a few pixels worth of damage, the second and third shot deal zero damage, and the fourth shot instantly melts the rest of the health bar? And why does only the first shot have a hit marker? I don't know how the game calculates damage dealt to these weak points points because it's illogical and unlike any other enemy in the game. It's also jarring seeing how long it takes to whittle down the yellow armor bars using the litho tools only to then see the huge red health bar almost instantly disappear in huge chunks. The rewards for conquering the Corruptor are also underwhelming. It always drops 3 Plague Hearts when the easier, safer, and less frustrating large Meteor event has a chance to drop 4. The Corruptor at least needs to drop more Plague Hearts. Ideally, its rewards should be reworked so it's still worth engaging with it after players are done with the Battle Pass and after Season 4 ends, but I'm well aware this would take more dev time to implement. Also, remember how Ghost Ship marketed the Corruptor leading up to Season 4 with it towering over the dwarves? Well, it's way smaller in-game to the point where the marketing feels borderline misleading. Oh, and guess what the odds are of actually getting Jet Boots and the Corruptor in the same mission so you can fly around it like in the promotional artwork. The raw probability is between 1-2% to chance per mission, but even lower than that for the average player since the Corruptor can't even spawn in Lithophage warning missions, which most players prioritize nowadays for script challenges. 
Why not just make it so engaging with the Corruptor guarantees jet boots? This would minimize the annoyance of managing the litho tools while traversing the caves and empower players by providing more counterplay to the corrupted patch and vine attacks. Perhaps when you strip the outer layer of armor completely, thus completing the first phase, then the Corruptor lets out some kind of sonar roar. And lore-wise, it allows the dwarves to detect a hidden mini cave nearby with jet boots, similar to how scanning a lost helmet allows the dwarves to locate the lost equipment. If jet boots are spawned in this way, it adds flavor to the different phases of the fight, and it gives additional rewards to the players for engaging with the Corruptor. The design I propose isn't easily exploitable either, where someone could just get the jet boots from the Corruptor fight and then skip it. Because if you've already stripped off half of the armor, you might as well just finish off the whole fight. You know what the saddest thing about the Corruptor is? If you're eagerly waiting to experience the fight for yourself, or even crazier, you actually enjoy fighting it, the Corruptor's low spawn chance means you can play dozens of hours without seeing one, if you're unlucky. Finishing 23 battle pass tiers, or going 30 hours, without getting to experience a core component of Season 4, just goes to show why pure RNG can be a lazy and bad way of implementing game systems. The easiest and most obvious solution to this is to just guarantee a Corruptor spawn in the Season 4 assignment. Option 2 would be to add a pity system on top of the existing RNG spawn chance. So if the Corruptor keeps its approximately 1 in 7 chance to spawn, but it hasn't spawned within, say, the past 10 missions, then the game would guarantee a spawn in in the next mission. The implementation could get a bit tricky like in a multiplayer lobby which players could affect this pity system, but I think it's an interesting idea worth exploring. Option 3 is to just make the Corruptor target farmable. Lore-wise, it just makes sense that the Corruptor would appear more often in the Rockpox biomes. Perhaps the spawn chance could be boosted to 20% or even higher in these zones, and slightly reduced in the others, thus satisfying both camps of players who want to seek out or avoid the Corruptor. Okay, I've ranted enough about this guy. Let's speed through the rest of the issues I've noticed. Pinging the foam on the Corruptor doesn't highlight the boss. You have to aim at an unfoamed part of it to get the outline to show up. I can't even keep this guy pinged. It's so dumb. Foam that sticks to a Corruptor can despawn after a while. So by the time you're done dealing with an ambient wave that spawned in during the fight, a lot of your previous work might get reset. Wait, did the foam that despawn? Oh my There's god. No way it I off. need to add that to the list. I need to add that to the list. If you're host and you hold down the vacuum, you can accidentally vacuum the foam before the game even registers it as landing on the Corruptor. This prevents any progress from being made and can straight up block the fight from starting. Corrupted patches can spawn on top of downed teammates or dropped litho tools, forcing players to tiptoe around the patch to try to avoid taking damage while trying to progress the fight. Apparently, the Corruptor can straight up bypass the gunner shield and attack you from inside, which is just insane. Seriously? I was gonna... <laughs> And fighting the Corruptor tanks frame rates because it's so particle heavy. Like, why do we need this many particles? This is so chaotic, bro. And my frames are dying. I'm down to like 70, 80 FPS. So yeah, adding all of this up and the Corruptor fight is officially Season 4's biggest disappointment. It really is a shame because I can appreciate how much dev time and effort goes into creating content like this, but I agree, it just straight up isn't fun in its current state. I hope changes can come soon enough in the season while the Corruptor is still relevant content. Otherwise, it'll end up in the same situation as the Lithophage Outbreak Warning, in which players just begrudgingly interact with the content or straight up despise it. Look, when posts like this make it up to the top spot on the Deep Rock subreddit, I think we can all agree that the Contagion Spikes could use some touch-ups as well. Regardless of how you feel about the warning, it's disappointing to be rewarded the same 50% hazard bonus, regardless of whether your mission has 1, 2, or 3 spikes. I feel like just this alone already primes players to dislike the warning, since rolling a mission with a max 3 spikes kind of just feels like a punishment. And sorry to burst your bubble, but that 50% hazard bonus isn't even as good as you probably think it is. It's not giving you 50% more XP than an identical mission without the warning, because the game is tacking on that 50% number onto some existing multiplier. Let's use a quote-unquote average mission that's has 4, medium complexity and length, which would have an innate hazard bonus of 120% already. Furthermore, hazard bonuses are added to a 100% base multiplier, so altogether, that has 4 mission would have a final hazard bonus multiplier of 220%. If you stack the lithophage warning on top of this, your multiplier becomes 270%. In this relatively representative example, the lithophage warning is only giving you 22.7% more XP, which just doesn't seem proportionate to having a whole unskippable objective tacked onto the mission, with the effort and risk that comes with dealing with the spikes and rockpox. 
The laziest solution would be to further increase Lithophage Outbreak's hazard bonus past 50%, but I hope to see Ghost Ship try a bit harder than that. I'd like it if completing each Contagion Spike rewards the team with some gold and nitra just like the mini meals in Salvage Missions. Most players burn through some ammo and health while dealing with the spike and its rock pox swarms, so having the spike add back to their nitra buffer would at least make the rest of the mission go smoother. If each Contagion Spike had a chance to give some other reward, it would at least make players feel better about rolling a mission with 3 spikes. Upon completion of a spike, maybe it has a chance to do the same sonar pulse as the corruptor, which would provide jet boots for the rest of the mission. Or the spikes could have a chance to drop large valuable objects, like plague hearts, compressed gold, bitter gems, air cubes, data cells, I don't know, just something. There's even wackier ideas, I'll throw this one out there. Maybe contagion spikes don't even need to be mandatory, but optional and risky to skip. Once you aggro a spike by getting close enough to draw the attention of the nearby rockpox larva, it could increase the odds of one of those big announced rockpox swarms until you clean the spike, which would lower the chance back down. Rockpox, swarm of infected almost on you, get ready. Choosing between conquering and skipping a spike becomes an interesting gameplay decision since you now have the option to take a calculated risk. Get lucky and you can get your mission done quickly and smoothly, but there's always a chance a mighty rockpox wave could jeopardize the whole run. Is this the smallest spike of all time? Yeah. That is Whoa! Nice. Blessed Please. spike. This is this is probably the best part of season five, is this goaded spike. It's the best part of season four and season. Oh yeah, three season four. Part. After over half a year of cleaning contagion spikes, I've noticed a meta has emerged where teams will foam the entire spike, then try to vacuum it all in one go, as fast as possible. I think there's two reasons for this. Reason one is that multitasking between cleaning and combat is so tedious because of the tools, and there's no need for all that if you can just clean the spikes in one go. Alright, that was the quickest I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, that in my was life. crazy. I also wish the litho tools were slightly more effective against the rock pox enemies. The tools don't need to cause damage, but simply buy you some more time so you can try to squeeze out the last of the cleaning before switching to fighting. Currently, the lithoformer can fear the rock pox, but it just wasn't implemented that well. I mean, it's pretty inconsistent. You can fear the rock pox grunt, praetorian, and spitter, but not the rock pox exploder, even though normal exploders are fearable. Wow. They forgot to make this guy fearable. You can't fear regular bombers or breeders, so I guess it's fair that it doesn't work on the Rockpox variants. Okay, so out of the two Litho tools, only one of them can do anything to the Rockpox enemies, and furthermore, it only works on only three out of the six Rockpox variants? I'm also pretty sure this Lithoformer fear mechanic was stealth added to the game, since I distinctly remember trying to foam the Rockpox enemies when they were introduced at the start of Season 3, as did the rest of the community, I'm sure, and it didn't do much of anything, and I don't recall seeing anyone else discussing this either. Furthermore, searching the patch note history for Lithofoam shows no mention of this mechanic. I didn't even know about it until one of the devs randomly mentioned it in a dev stream a few weeks ago. Yo, I have a question for you, actually. Mm -hmm. Did you know shooting the lithofoamers um, actually has an effect on the rock pox? What exactly does it do? <laughs> okay, good. I'm not the only one, but it actually, it fears them. What? I know. That's so dumb. Instead of the inconsistent fearing that we have now, maybe foaming the bugs can cause them to be distracted, forcing them to shake off the foam before they can continue to pursue you. Or foaming the floor could grant you a buffer by slowing down the rock pox when they step in it. Maybe there could be a funny little slipping animation where they're sliding all over the foam. The lithovac could help out too by sucking up the gas surrounding the spikes and left behind by rockpox enemies, thus helping to slow down the rate at which your rockpox meter fills up. This leads us into the second reason for the all-in-one go meta for dealing with the spikes, which is the fact that just existing in close proximity to rockpox enemies is so punishing. Spawning the rockpox all at once and then dipping is much safer, since you can immediately retreat and fight the rockpox in better terrain, and it's much harder for your rockpox meter to completely fill up if you fight them at range. It's also much more ammo efficient, since you can group them up and clear the whole horde with a breach cutter shot, gunner nade, or C4. The sad thing is, fighting the rockpox wasn't always this unfun. I remember the turning point, one fateful patch that changed things forever. Here's a quick rundown on the lore. Early on in Season 3, players discovered that drilling the rockpox would instantly kill them with little risk. The devs addressed this with a heavy-handed approach, ruining the rockpox combat for everyone else in the process. You see, in a subsequent patch, the rockpox blisters were changed to emit a strong burst of rockpox gas when popped, significantly filling the rockpox meter for any nearby dwarf. Sure, it fixed the drills being OP, but it also introduced the tiny little side effect of just ruining the combat experience for everyone else. Here's why the devs approach the drill nerf in the wrong way. Rockbox blisters are, number one, smaller than most other weak points in the game, and number two, located all over the enemy's body. 
These two design decisions encourage and reward a player for fighting up close. I know I'm stating the obvious here, but smaller targets are easier to hit the closer you are, and you can rotate to a weak point at the back of an enemy quicker if you're closer to said enemy. With this nerf, however, suddenly the Rockbox enemy design is signaling to the player two conflicting strategies. Come close to hit the weak points with accuracy, but stay away so your meter doesn't fill up. In my opinion, this is one of the core reasons why fighting Rockbox nowadays feels so unfun. I don't even think it would have been hard to nerf the drills in a more appropriate manner. Just make it so that if the blisters are popped via melee damage, then they'll emit the gas like they currently do. Otherwise, they don't emit any rockbox gas. This way, players wouldn't feel pigeonholed into the retreat-only strategy when fighting the rockbox, which is basically the only strategy we currently have. I'm no game designer, but funneling players into a single viable playstyle just doesn't seem like good balancing. Of course, none of this matters if you bring NG's Breach Cutter, which trivializes a rockbox perhaps even more so than the drills. Which brings up the question why one was nerfed while the other got off scot-free. So now we've entered the fourth season straight of fighting factions of enemies that are mostly annoying to deal with, unless you bring that one busted build that instantly deletes them. I'm sensing a pattern and it's not a good one. Coming into Season 4, I think a lot of us were looking forward to seeing how Ghost Ship would improve the rockbox experience, but it seems like it's gone the other way. Oh my god, this is so unfun, this is so unfun, this is so unfun. Bosco, can you do something? Can you do something for me? Why did the devs feel the need to, for example, make the contagion spikes even harder? Were the spikes not challenging enough already? And why are the new Season 4 Rockbox variants even more annoying to deal with? Like seriously, I don't know how some of the new Rockbox enemies made it out of internal playtesting in their current state. Here, let's compare the Rockbox Goo Bomber to the standard variant. The normal Goo Bomber has two huge glowing weak points at the bottom. This makes sense for a flying enemy that randomly paths near you. The weak points are almost always accessible from any angle and easy to hit regardless of what weapon you're using. The Rockbox variant, however, has three tiny blisters that can spawn anywhere but on the sacks. The sacks can be popped, but barely even does any damage to the creature. So the blisters that you actually need to target are higher up on an enemy that is already, by design, flying above you. And because of its random pathing, oftentimes the blisters are hidden on the opposite side relative to you. In a vacuum, it may seem simple enough to just move over and shoot it from the other side. But in the context of a real mission, you're also fighting a whole horde of other Rockbox enemies, which are also denying which areas you can stay in. Or you might be facing some wonky cave gen making it impossible to reposition. If you're not convinced, here's some footage of the devs themselves literally struggling to kill a Rockbox goo bomber, then eventually giving up and letting their teammates handle it. I guess that's always a viable strategy, just let someone else deal with the issue. All of this applies equally to the Rockbox Breeder. Being forced to pop every single little Rockbox blister scattered about on a huge flying creature is just so much more tedious than being able to just shoot at its mouth, which is the normal breeder's weak point. Here's what I'm getting at. A lot of this Rockbox enemy design contradicts existing enemy design principles in this game. And it's a shame because those existing enemies were designed their way for good reason. And don't even get me started on the Rockbox spitters. Tink. Tink. Ah, the rock box got me. Do, 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 do. The context in which we fight Rockbox Spitters contributes a lot to how frustrating they can feel. Since again, I know this is obvious, but we're not fighting them in a vacuum. In a mission, you're probably already annoyed by dealing with the spike and the litho tools. You're probably kiting a few Rockbox grunts or larvae, and your Rockbox meter is already partially full from just being close to the spike and the enemies. Then suddenly, this sneaky bug can spawn out of nowhere and aimbot you, CCing you in probably one shot, maybe two on a good day, which at least on has 5 results in a down more often than not. Don't forget the Rockbox Spitter is probably shooting at you from up high on a wall or a ceiling, and man, being forced to aim at those little blisters at long range just feels like a waste of ammo. And I think that's the fundamental issue with these new Rockbox enemies. The whole Rockbox mechanic seems to nudge players to position themselves in this sweet spot where you're close enough to easily hit the weak points, but not close enough where your Rockbox meter instantly fills up. This is doable for Grunts and Praetorians, but you have much less control over the engagement distance between you and a Spitter or a Goo Bobber or a Breeder. I mean, these are all inherently ranged enemies. I'd like to see Rockbox enemies be slightly easier to kill if you're not able to hit all the blisters. For enemies with 3 blisters like Grunts, Acid Spitters, and Goo Bombers, make it so popping 2 will kill them. For tankier enemies with more blisters like Praetorians and Breeders, make it even more forgiving, but within reason of course. Alternatively, make a Rockbox enemy take more base damage anywhere on the body the fewer blisters it has remaining. This retains the intended Rockbox playstyle of prioritizing blisters, but makes combat more forgiving instead of being forced to play Ring Around the Rosy with the Praetorian just trying to look for the last one. Rockbox also just have some other weird quirks that aren't congruent with the rest of the game's design. 
Killing a frozen rock pox enemy will remove its gas cloud on death effect, but popping a blister on a nearby frozen enemy still will fill up your meter significantly. And why is it impossible to TCF a simple rock pox grunt at full health? It's so strange to the point that it seems like it was deliberately designed this way because C4s have no issue one-shotting them. We also have to address the other half of this equation, which is how miserable it feels to be incapacitated by the rock pox. All the button mashing that's required to break free is just starting to wear thin and it's bad outdated game design. It's inaccessible for gamers with certain disabilities and can lead to repetitive stress injuries. Come on, man. When asked about potential alternatives on stream, the devs have said something along the lines of, well, if we allowed a more accessible option, everyone would just choose to skip the challenge and default to that instead. I know Twitch chat isn't the best medium for facilitating nuanced discussion, but the devs really miss the point here. Spamming A and D mindlessly doesn't involve much skill, it's not fun, it's not interesting, and that's why it's almost universally disliked. There's better ways to design this challenge without trivializing it, and if Ghost Ship truly are stumped, I can make a whole separate video on this, because this one sure has dragged on for long enough. For Season 4, Ghost Ship really should have focused on improving Rockbox to make it an enjoyable challenge, instead of just slapping blisters on a few more types of enemies and calling it a day. By the time Season 5 rolls around, Rockbox will have been the core seasonal gimmick for at least a full year, and that's just too long for it to remain unchecked. Throughout Deep Rock's life cycle, the Ghost Ship devs have been very intentional about not introducing player power creep as the game has matured. The new weapons introduced in Season 1 and 2 are well balanced when compared to their direct counterparts, for example. And even recent balance changes like the reworked double barrel overclock are interesting without necessarily being best in slot picks. So tell me why did the devs throw this philosophy completely out the window when it comes to Stingtail balance? You could make the argument that the Stingtail is overtuned in every single metric possible, and you know what, I will make that argument, so here we go. First, the Stingtail is incredibly lethal, especially in the higher hazards which have scaled up fall damage. If the Stingtail grabs you from above, it becomes a gamble as to whether you'll get randomly propelled into a guaranteed death. From the start of the season to now, the devs have attempted to reel its attack in with two patches. First, they modified the Stingtail AI so it can't grab you if it's more than 10 meters above you. This was a pretty pathetic band-aid solution to be frank, because after that patch, the Stingtail could still yeet you into oblivion. Wait, what the Whoa. fuck? Oh no, that poor oh. NG, that poor- Oh my god, oh I got my god. Got bullied. They just got bullied. In the second patch, they tried again to fix how the Stingtail would fling players too high, but it's still extremely janky, and it can still definitely pull players up and over past it, which seems like unintended behavior. I'm also pretty sure that one of the recent patches introduced a completely new bug, where the Stingtail will occasionally attempt a grab that's much further than its supposed 20 meter range. Even if you completely remove the grab's damage from the equation, it's still an extremely disruptive attack. If there's a Stingtail near you while you're trying to iron will to resupply or revive a teammate, you're basically screwed unless you eliminate the Stingtail first, and there's usually not enough time to do all of this in a single Iron Will. Sure, a Grabber or Shellback also have the potential to interrupt Iron Will in the same way, but any chip damage will make the Grabber retreat for a while, and a Shellback rolling attack is much less accurate than the Stingtail's grab. For being such a strong and disruptive attack, the Stingtail's grab is also much too accurate and frequent. It's borderline absurd that it can attack 3-4 to four times faster than a Mactera Grabber, which is the fairest comparison since they're both disabler enemies. Imagine if Ghost Ship introduced a new Dreadnought that attacked three times faster than the existing ones, it would be game-breakingly busted and everyone would be calling for nerfs. So why does the Stingtail get to spam its attacks with impunity? It just doesn't make sense. Because of the Stingtail grab's accuracy and speed, it doesn't seem like there's a consistent way to dodge the attack. And if there is, it's unintuitive and poorly conveyed to the player, compared to even something like the Tri-Jaw attack. Sure, I could boot up sandbox utilities to study how the grab works if I really wanted to, but isn't the fact that I have to do that in itself a failure in game design? I've also seen some buggy grabs where players, regardless of whether their host or client, can get grabbed around corners. The grab can also clip you into the terrain. In this example, I'm stuck until I power attack myself out. Second, the Stingtail is deceptively tanky. It's got 80% of the health of a Praetorian, which is kind of jarring since the Stingtail is physically much smaller. While the Stingtail's weak points take more damage than the Praetorian's, they're much better protected by armor. Furthermore, for some godforsaken reason, the devs decided to upgrade the Stingtail's light armor to heavy armor during the experimental branch testing phase. If I'm gonna be honest, this is one of the most baffling balance changes in the history of the game, and definitely at least since I started playing in Season 1. Here's why, continuing to use the Praetorian in our example, since it likewise has heavy armor. It's quite easy to bait out the Praetorian's spit attack, which renders it immobile and gives you plenty of time to rotate around to shoot at its huge glowing weak point on its butt. Taking armor break is nice to have, but doesn't feel mandatory 
at all for enemy design like this, especially for someone like Scout who can easily grapple to its rear. Things couldn't be any more different for the Stingtail. It feels like you have to destroy most of the armor for it to open up its weak points before you can start doing any significant damage to it. One of my favorite Scout builds, Bounty Drag combined with Embedded Deaths, is just laughably weak against the Stingtail since it doesn't have much armor break, and Embedded Deaths can't really deal damage past heavy armor until it's broken off. This is a build that I've had hundreds of hours playing with and never really struggled with in Has 5 before this season. Third, the Stingtail is a sneaky little bastard which just makes fighting it pretty frustrating at times. In a game where darkness is one third of the tagline and a primary source of difficulty, high priority targets are balanced by being easy to spot with glowing weak points or bright colored skin. The new Septic Spreader is a great example of this design philosophy. In comparison, the Stingtail is much harder to spot in a crowd or in suboptimal lighting. Also, why does the most disruptive and highest priority enemy in the game have a calming baby blue colored weak point? This color doesn't really scream FOCUS ON ME in all caps like it should. Also, I don't know if it's just me, but I find the directionality of the Stingtail's audio cues significantly harder to discern. Whenever I hear a grabber screech, it's clear enough which direction I can expect it to come from. And even if I do get caught off guard, I have the option to counter it with Heightened Sense's passive warning overlay and active release. The Stingtail's warning sound gets lost in the audio mix easily, and the creature itself is fully immune to Heightened Senses, unlike the other disablers in the game such as grabbers, leeches, and Nyaka trawlers. Regardless of whether you think Heightened Sense should counter the Stingtail, I do think it's important to note that the perk can act as an accessibility feature for hearing impaired players who now have it even worse because of the Stingtail's immunity to it. Also, the Stingtail's audio cue will sometimes straight up not play. It seems to happen the most often when there's multiple of them. Yo, that Stingtail didn't even make a sound! No, dude, it didn't even make a sound again! When you start analyzing the creatures of Deep Rock and break them down into specific stats, Pokemon style, you're left with the inevitable conclusion that the Stingtail is in a league of its own. It has far too many strengths and not enough weaknesses, and there's not many counters to the Stingtail besides the run-of-the-mill status effects like Stun, Fear, and Freeze. Once grabbed, only Scout has a reliable way of escaping with their grapple. NG's plats can protect you from fall damage, but it's not the most reliable. And good luck if you're Gunner or Driller. Even worse, in Season 4's Experimental Branch's final patch, the devs further nerfed any potential counterplay by completely disabling any air control the player has over their dwarf after being grabbed by the Stingtail. I can't help but feel like a change like that is just unnecessarily punishing on top of everything else the Stingtail can do. So yeah, the Stingtail is not in great shape right now, even after multiple patches that have attempted to reel it in, which is a shame because I think it's a unique concept for an enemy. It just wasn't executed all that well. Here's a few ideas as to how it could be improved. No more Stingtail! The most elegant solution that I could think of, which would solve many of the Stingtail's pain points, would be to make the tip of its tail a glowing weak point that's always accessible. This would improve Stingtail visibility and also effectively make the Stingtail less tanky since you would have immediate access to weak point damage instead of being forced to shred its heavy armor first. When the Stingtail starts to telegraph its grav, the whole tail should start glowing as well, giving players a clear visual indicator that the attack is about to happen. The tail's grab windup animation could be improved so it's easier to spot in the midst of a crowd of enemies. If the tail shoots upwards before grabbing, it'd command more visual attention. And lore-wise, it's like the tail needs a better vantage point to scope out which dwarf to grab. Furthermore, this grab should be interruptible. If you shoot the tail weak point anytime between the windup and before you're grabbed, it should stagger the sting tail, canceling the grab and delaying its next attack. You might realize these suggestions basically make the sting tail behave like the Mectera grabber, and that's exactly the point. They're both disabler type creatures, and the sting tail sorely needs more of these counterplay interactions, so players have more options than to just drop everything and deal with it right now because it's so busted OP. If Ghost Ship wants to polish the sting tail up more and add further depth to the combat, it'd be cool if its tail was breakable after enough damage is dealt to it, leaving the Stingtail only able to perform its melee horn attack. This would follow existing enemy designs such as the Goo Bomber. Pop its sacks and it can't lay down goo anymore, just its weak projectile attack. To fix the cheesy one-shot fall damage moments, which definitely still do happen after the patches, I think the best solution would be to implement some sort of fall damage cap after a player has been grabbed by a Stingtail. This fall damage cap could be based on the revive health at each has level and essentially guarantee the player that they can never dip below this health value due to fall damage from a Stingtail. I can't stress how much less frustrating it is to get chunked down to 15 health and being able to walk away instead of taking a full down. And I think this approach would work better than what the devs have attempted so far in the patches. 
Between the Stingtail's armor and health, I think at least one of them needs to be nerfed. I think a good first step would be to just revert its armor back to light armor like how it was at the start of the experimental branch. This would make its time to kill more consistent and less dependent on armor break mods or weapons that just straight up bypass armor like Breach Cutter. And this might just be my opinion, but I do think the Stingtail could use a small reduction in health. It just doesn't make sense that it's 80% as tanky as a Praetorian given its much smaller size. A Stingtail having 65% of a Praetorian's HP would make more sense and bring it closer to the Mactera Grabber's health value. This is about a 20% decrease in health, which is significant but not drastic. I would also revert the patch that removed player control when they're in the air, and reduce the spawn chance of another Stingtail if there's already one on the map. Multiple Stingtails synergize and become exponentially more annoying, and it also bugs out their audio cues. Look how annoying two Stingtails is. Oh yeah, see that guy didn't make the sound. So yeah, the Stingtail is great in theory, but Ghost Ship fumbled its implementation. I'm expecting it will be nerfed soon. Uh, uh Mr. Stingtail, why are you my shield? Oh my god, he just wants to be friends! Stingtail Steve won. Altogether, Season 4 missed its mark for me on a fundamental game design level. In gaming, there's an important distinction between a fun challenge and a frustrating challenge, and the difference is usually what kinds of tools players are given to conquer said challenge. Is the game imposing its will on you, or are you able to finesse your way out of a sticky situation? Between the Rockpox and Stingtail and the lack of player counterplay regarding the two, I've had more time to take a guaranteed down type of moments in Season 4 than the previous three seasons combined. This isn't good game design, it doesn't facilitate engaging gameplay, it's just plain unfun. But still, as a staunch Ghost Ship supporter and someone who owns every single paid DLC pack, it really is disappointing how plain the Decontaminator DLC looks. And yes, this is after accounting for the minor improvements the devs made in response to all the negative sentiment the DLC received when it was teased. I want to commend the devs for attempting to make things right, but at the same time I think it's fair to point out that the pack as a whole is still a step back from the rival tech DLC, which is the fairest comparison since it's the other most recent $8 weapon DLC pack. If you were to ask me what the coolest things about the decontaminator weapons were, I would say it's the tubing and the vials. They're the framework's most distinct visual features and have the most potential to give the weapons a unique look and a distinct silhouette. So tell me why did Ghost Ship put the majority of the tubing and vials on the right side of the weapons, facing away from the players when viewed in first person perspective? This is a genuine question because it's such a baffling decision to put all the cool stuff out of view. I'm pretty sure that design decision is a main reason why there was so much initial backlash regarding the DLC pack. A lot of the small weapons were placed with their left side facing up in the initial teaser screenshots. And remember, this is the same side that we view in game in first person view. In the reworked DLC update post, the devs flipped a lot of the models in the updated screenshots, essentially confirming, oh, the cool part is the side that you won't see in game. Wait, why does my why does my EPC look so boring? I I can't even tell if I have anything oh, on. Oh, when I drop 8 bucks to buy a pack and then have moments in game where I'm literally questioning if I'm even using the new frameworks because it's not immediately distinctive, I'm not gonna lie, it makes me feel like I wasted my money. Looking back at the rival tech pack, my favorite aspect is that some of the weapons like the cryo cannon have moving parts when firing. This increased attention to detail and interactivity was where I thought Ghost Ship would head towards with future paid weapon frameworks like the decontaminator pack. Yes, we got the heart rate monitor type screens, but they're essentially just looping GIFs. I really think it was a missed opportunity to not have interactive features like weapon tubing that pulses while firing or glows when the gun is about to overheat or while you're reloading it. These are the types of unique features that a more experienced Ghost Ship Games is capable of producing nowadays, and it's what provides clear separation between new $8 premium weapon DLC packs and the free season pass ones. Stepping back a bit and analyzing the DLC sets as a whole, I find it a bit absurd that now we have what seems like an excessive amount of weapon frameworks and paint jobs, yet still absolutely zero customization for our support tools. Unless you resort to mods, that is. It kinda seems like an easy win for Ghost Ship to add at least paint jobs to the support tools, and it'd be cool to see support tool frameworks that match existing weapon frameworks, perhaps as cheaper paid DLC packs or as part of future seasons battle passes. When even the paid DLC that makes this whole seasonal model work is not a resounding home run, it really makes you question how things are going over at Ghost Ship Games. When season 4 as a whole feels underbaked, yet also took longer than previous seasons to release, it paints a picture of a dev team that's being bogged down. Whether it's questionable decision making, mismanaged prioritization, or something else, that's a whole other can of worms that's worth a whole other video. All I'll say for now is that for future seasons, I hope Ghost Ship can focus more on improving the core gameplay loop. This could be things like new biomes and new mission types. And 
and I hope they can address popular issues and pain points that players have. A focus on improving frame rates after multiple seasons of declining performance would be much welcome as well. You know it's getting bad when the 120Hz mode on PS5 drops down to the 40s. We don't need to continue on the path of adding yet another gimmicky seasonal faction of enemies and mini bosses. Cause to be honest, looking at Ghost Ship's track record, they have consistently shown that they don't have what it takes to successfully launch robots or rockpox in a good state within the 6 months that they have to create a new season. And what we end up is getting new content that looks cool and markets well, but it isn't all that fun to engage with. Honestly, that's okay. I actually really admire the strict no crunch policy that Ghost Ship abides by and the studio's generous vacation policy where everyone gets a month long summer vacation, for example. The solution to these issues doesn't have to be, oh, just work more, crunch harder, nor should it be. I hope Ghost Ship knows that they can dial back their future ambitions a bit to afford themselves a bandwidth to polish whatever they have planned for us in the future. Because it's a shame that a lot of the hard work that they've been putting into the game recently just feels like content for the sake of pumping out content. There are cool ideas that are never able to reach their full potential, since everything just gets relegated for yet another flashy, unpolished game mechanic to take its place when the next season rolls around. Well, that's all my thoughts on Season 4. Let me know down in the comments if you agree, or even more importantly, if you disagree. I hope we can have a civilized discussion about how the game can change for the better, because this game's been lacking this discourse recently. And I just want to give a sincere thanks to the handful of people who have even made it this far. I know this was a chonker of a video, but honestly, Season 4 whiffs so hard for me and my friends that it spurred me into working on this monster of a critique. I get filled with a kind of empty sadness nowadays when I look at my Steam's friends list, which is almost entirely populated by people that I met through playing Deep Rock. Hell, I built a gaming PC to switch over from PlayStation because of this game specifically, to play with a bigger population and to have mods. But with the launch of each new season, I see fewer friends sticking around to check out the content, and sadder yet, I don't even blame them. I get that people's interests change and it's natural to move on to shinier, newer games, but a lot of this is also the direct result of Ghost Ship fumbling the execution of recent seasons. The gameplay loop at its core really hasn't gotten much more enjoyable in the past year or even longer. I still have faith in Ghost Ship and I really do hope my season 5 review can be more positive. But that's it for me, and until next time, take care.